Good morning. Good morning. Happy Monday to you. It's Monday, June 13th, 2022, year of our Lord. Before we go any further, I just want to warn you, this is not a milk video. This is not going to be milk. This is going to be meat, okay? If you're looking for a quick shot in the arm kind of lovey-dovey kind of thing um this is not it uh we are going to be going over uh the topic the question what is a covenant what is a testament we are going to be examining the scriptures to see what the scriptures say a covenant is what the scriptures say a testament is and we're also going to consider and look and we're going to see in the scriptures, are we in fact under the new covenant today? When does the new covenant come in? What about the old covenant? That kind of thing. That's what we're going to be looking at today. This is not milk, okay? This is meat. So if you're not looking for meat or anything, if you don't want to learn anything today, then go, go away. Go away. If you want to learn something, let's learn something today. Shall we? Shall we? Okay. Now, like I said, we're going to be in the scriptures. And please, I'm using an old friend today. An old friend. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. The King James Version. And turn with me in your authorized version of the scriptures. To Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. I utilize what is called the law of first mention. And that states that you, when you find a word that you question its meaning within the authorized version of the scriptures... The very first appearance of that word, genuine, uh, genuine, uh, genuinely, uh, generally, usually defines the term. But you got to remember, the definition of a word founded within Scripture is always dependent on the context in which it appears. What is the context? I, I use the analogy of a sandwich. You know, you got bread on the top and bread on the bottom, and in the middle is the meat of the sandwich. In order to get the, into, uh, the entire nutrients of the sandwich, you got to eat the whole thing, not just take the meat out of the middle like some people like to do. Okay? But this thing about the covenant and about the uh, testament, I will have you know, I will have you know, the word testament appears in the authorized version 14 times. And the word covenant appears almost 300 times, okay? But see, when you're reading a Bible, okay, like I've said to you before, yes, this says Holy Bible. But within the context of the pages, the actual text of Scripture itself, the Scriptures never refer to itself as that, okay? So it's all about distinction. Okay? The authorized version is God's perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration, word of God for us today. Okay? Which must be rightly divided. But see, when you read a Bible, okay, I told you Genesis 6. Let's let's start with this. Let's uh, let's start with this. Testament. Okay? The word testament. And a brother uh, had a, the brilliant idea of putting um and it was brilliant. Uh, putting the Bible verses within the description in the comment section. I'm going to do that myself. That was a good idea. But in Matthew chapter 26, let's start there first. Beg your pardon. Okay? Matthew chapter 26. We are going to be concentrating on the word covenant more so. But to, to illustrate this to you, in Matthew chapter 26... In the authorized version of the scriptures, we will be reading verses 26 on to verse 29. Follow me along, word for word, verse by verse, at what we are going to be looking at today. 
follow me along. Make sure I'm not skipping a groove. Make sure I'm being accurate with you. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Make sure. Follow me along. Okay, check me out. Keep me in line. I'm accountable to the body of Christ, the church, and living God. Okay? Check me out. Matthew 26, verses 26 on to verse 29. Okay? And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood in the New Testament. The New Testament. Okay? Which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. New Testament. Here's the thing. Check your NIV. Check your ESV. Check your NLT. Check your New American Standard. Check the uh, Living Standard Bible. Check the Holman. Check the uh, Amplified. Okay? What do they do? They take out Testament and put Covenant in there. Okay? Check it out. Check it out. There will be links in the... Uh, not links, but uh, the verses to show you, to prove to you. Okay? That the Bibles take out Testament. And put it in covenant. And see, when you look in Webster's even, Noah Webster, when you look up the word testament, he he himself even likes to say that testament and covenant are pretty much the same. I love Noah Webster's work. His dictionary is great. I recommend it. Mr. Noah Webster has botched it on several occasions. Testament and covenant, are they the same thing? While there may be slight similarities, we're going to see they are actually quite different. They are not the same thing. Okay? They are not. All right? But, hey, Scripture is going to prove this to us. Okay? And while we're on this kick, let's look at Mark chapter 14. Okay? Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Verses 22 on to verse 25 in, Mac, or in Mark chapter 14. Okay? It's the same thing, but I'm showing you. It's testament. The Bibles take out testament and put in covenant. Why do they do that? We'll get to that in a little bit. But, verses 22 on to verse 25. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Okay? And like I said, you check this out in the Bibles. Take out testament and they replace it with covenant. Which is actually quite a dastardly thing to do. Well, like I said, we'll talk about that more a little later. And Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Okay, we're going to be going through these. All right. We're going to be going through these. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. We want verses 19 and 20. And he took bread, and gave thanks, and brake it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. The New Testament in his blood. Okay, Our Lord Jesus Christ was the testator. The New Testament begins after the death of the testator. Okay? But while we're on this train, now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Okay? The bulk of the word testament that we are going to be looking at is found in the book of Hebrews uh, chapter 9. And we're going to be reading the whole chapter. We've got a lot of scripture we're going to be going over today. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 
We want verses 23 on to verse 26. And Paul here is talking about the, the um, communion, okay? And communion is not salvific as the Catholic will tell you. Because the Catholic will tell you that you have to drink his blood and eat his flesh. The Catholic worship flesh. And flesh to a Catholic is the little Eucharist cookie, okay? Um, the, uh, what is it, the Last Supper, the communion. It's a time of, a time of reflection, of self-examination. Because in verse 28 in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Because if you do that unworthily, many people are sick, uh, weak, that kind of thing. So communion is a time of self-reflection, of examination, okay? Also of praise, yes, but it in no way is salvific pertaining to salvation. Catholics tell you otherwise, it's not so. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 on to verse 26, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, do, broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Okay? After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Okay? So Paul is basically quoting what our Lord already quoted. Okay? And again, it's New Testament. Like I said, check it out. The Bibles will put covenant. Hmm. Very deceptive. Very vile. And first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We want verses 1 on to verse 6. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation for you, from you? Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, making reference unto the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And we talk, uh, we discuss this in the video rebuking the disgusting, vile heretics at that channel, Bible is Mark of Beast. Okay, that will be in the description box. We go, at, uh, we go over this towards the end of that video, okay? We discuss that in that video. That will be in the description box. And such trust have we through Christ to God word. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not New Covenant. New Testament. Because guess what? The New Covenant is not, in, is not applicable today. Oh! Yeah, we're going to look at that. Don't worry. Yeah, we're not under the New Covenant yet. Okay? The New Covenant is not yet. This is the New Testament, but it is not the New Covenant yet. Don't worry. Don't worry. Stay with me. Okay? Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter. Not of the letter. What does that mean? Heretics like Bible is Mark of Beast will say, not you don't need to read the scriptures. Just like their, their brother who's in hell, uh, Jean Bashoff, said. No, when it says the letter, it's talking about the law of Moses. The law, okay? That's what it's talking about, okay? It's not talking about not reading the scriptures. Like I said in that video, rebuking those vile scum heretics at Biola's work of beast, okay? We get into that, be in the description box, okay? who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, lowercase s. 
For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. The letter killeth. Yes, the law kills you. It was given to give you life, to keep you away from the things that God hates, but trying to adhere your life to it perfectly, it, you can't do it. You can't do it. Like today, we are unable to follow Christ if it wasn't for his grace through our faith, see? Okay? But now skipping a little bit, let's go to verses 12 on to verse 16 here in First Corinthians and Second Corinthians chapter 3. 12 on to verse 16. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. And that's plainly obvious with heretics like Mark the Messenger, who's teaching you that you've got to keep the law in order to be saved. He's not a saved man himself. Okay, That video will also be in the... See, that video and the video about Bible as Mark of the Beast deals with all this kind of stuff. So it's going to be pertinent. And also, the last video that was done on this channel that the Lord gave me to do about James chapter 2 will also be in the description box because they all work together. Okay? But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord... The veil shall be taken away. Okay? So we see testament. When the Bibles will take away testament and put it in covenant. Mm. Mm. And a more better definition of a testament will be, we will, uh, we will find out. But now, what about this covenant thing? Now, go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, we are going to be reading verses 9 on to verse 18 in Genesis chapter 6. Okay? Verses 9 on to verse 18 in Genesis chapter 6. Please follow me along. Backstory. God's going to destroy the earth with a flood. Because, in verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Okay? Only evil continually. Man's heart is evil. Plainly, plainly put. Okay? God was going to destroy the earth. And the flood of Noah is a prefiguration, a type of the redemption of the purchased possession. Okay? God destroyed the world with the flood. But the righteous, those who followed God, who God, who were with God, went into the ark, made out of gopher wood, and they were spared the wrath of God. Okay? The flood is a type of the redemption of the purchased possession that is coming. Erroneously referred to as the pre-tribulation rapture. And you're right, rapture is not in the scriptures. But the redemption of the purchase possession is. Catching way is. And the flood of Noah is a type of that. Okay? God's wrath and judgment upon the earth, which lasted for a time. But see, the time of Jacob's trouble, which is coming after this dispensation, will last for seven years. Seven years of God's wrath. And y'all think you're going to endure to the end, huh? <laughs> Good luck. But, okay, the flood of Noah was a type of of the redemption of the purchase possession. When you got someone who is actively preaching against the redemption of the purchase possession, it's one of three things. One, they're ignorant and don't know better. Fine. Links in the description box. Two, they are will willfully ignorant. They know, but they don't want to accept the truth. Hence, a deceiver. And three, an outright deceiver who preaches contrary to the redemption of the pur purchased possession. That one, the third for sure, is lost. If you preach actively against the redemption of the purchased possession and you are not ignorant, uh, you're lost. 
You're lost. Those guys at the NIFB preach against the redemption of the purchased possession, but Christians go through the time, the great tribulation, as they call it. Uh, yeah, they're lost. They're lost. Okay? Mark the messenger preaches against the redemption of the purchased possession. He says it's a lie. He's lost. Okay? There are those out there who want to call saved people lost because they speak against the Roman Catholic holiday Christ Mass and the God thereof. But beside that, okay, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, heretics want to call uh, saved people lost for teach, uh, speaking the truth against the Roman Catholic holiday Christ Mass. But never mind that. More on that in December. But if you are speaking, teaching contrary to the scriptures, of the redemption of the purchased possession. You're lost. They're lost. Get away from them. Okay? They're lost. If they're ignorant, that's a different thing. If they're willfully ignorant, eh. but if they're teaching contrary and denying the truth of Scripture, they're lost. Get away from them. Okay? But, verses 9 on to verse 18, about covenant. First mention. Let's read. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. <laughs> what, do you think? what do you think we've got going on nowadays, huh? Yeah, let's continue. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. G-O-P-H-E-R. By the way, okay? Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. Um, kind of like how our Lord gave specific instructions unto Moses how to build the tabernacle and stuff like that. God is very specific. God is a God of distinction. He doesn't mince words. Okay? He is clear in the scriptures. God is not the author of confusion. Satan, through his Bibles, through his church, Roman Catholicism. Okay, they are the ones that sow confusion. God is very plain. He, is, uh, he has magnified his word above all his name. Okay? But he's very specific, very distinct in his directions, in his instructions. Verse 16. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou fashion it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. With lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And some have even talked about the, how the opening in the side of the ark is reminiscent onto how they pierced the side of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so I've heard that one before. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Verse 18. But with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. So, Noah and his three sons and their wives, eight people, eight souls, only we're on the ark, okay? Never mind that stupid Hollywood movie with Gladiator and a Wrestle Crow, okay? There were only eight souls, eight persons, spirit, soul, and body, within the ark, okay? And as I told you, the ark, the, the tale of the flood, is a prefiguration of the redemption of the purchased possession. God sparing the righteous from the wrath that was coming in an ark made of gopher wood, okay? Again, the, the mention, the, the implication of the redemption of the purchased possession is literally without the scripture. 
Anyone teaches against it, they're a heretic and lost. If they're ignorant, that's something else. But if they ain't ignorant, then they're a heretic lost and going to hell and damning you people. Because, hey, remember, Christians aren't going to go through the Great Tribulation. But the Church of God, which is the Church of the Living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, we are going to be redeemed for the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? But right there. But with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy son and thy wife, and thy son's wives with thee. So a covenant is basically a promise, a contractual agreement. Well, it wasn't contracted at that time. Well, no, but maybe we, we have it in writing. Okay? Okay? A covenant, an oath, a promise. Okay? And note who's the one who instigated it. Okay? It's the better making a covenant with the lesser. Don't, don't miss that. Don't miss that. Okay? So this is a promise, an, an agreement, a contractual kind of thing. Okay? But now let's go to Genesis chapter 9. Okay? So, God said unto Noah, But with thee will, will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. That's the first mention of the word covenant within the authorized version of the scriptures. Now go to um, Genesis chapter 9. We are going to be reading verses 8 on to verse 17. Now this, okay. This was after, uh, wait, 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 wait. Is this a, uh, yeah, this is after the flood, okay. God did what he said he was going to do. He's like, hey, get in the ark, all y'all. And he brought the flood and destroyed the earth, okay. And here we go. Verses 8 on to verse 17. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And that is significant because after the flood, the whole world was overspread by the three. Shem, the Asiatics, such as the Hebrews, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Chinese, that kind of stuff, the Vietnamese, okay? That kind of stuff, all right? Those, those uh, kindreds are of Shem. Japheth, the Europeans, okay? You know, like the Norwegians, the English, the French, that kind of stuff. Ham, the Egyptians, the Africans, stuff like that, okay? By those three, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, okay? The earth was overspread, okay? That is significant. Okay, I am of Japheth. Okay, Mark the messenger is of Ham. And there are those like Will Schneblin or something. He is of Shem, who is actually a Hebrew of the descended line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you got to remember, the Hebrew is derived from Shem. Okay, the Asiatics. That's why there are those who are of Shem, such as the Chinese, the Japanese, the Vietnamese, those of Thailand, whatnot, okay? And uh, our American Indians, okay? They dwell in tents. They are of Shem, okay? They are of Shem. But there are those who are of Shem who are not Hebrew, okay? You got to remember that. Uh, there'll be links in the description box if you have any questions, okay? But let's continue. And behold, verse 9. I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, his three sons, and the lineage therein. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, for all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. What is this covenant? Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. You see that? What is this covenant? And the covenant part also, that there was something with this, of uh, being fruitful and multiply. But the main gist of the covenant that he made with Noah was exactly this. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be, neither shall there any more be a flood 
to destroy the earth. That's the gist of the covenant. Yes, going forth and being fruitful. Yes, to repopulate the earth. Yes, yes. But the gist of the covenant was that he wasn't going to destroy the earth as he did with water. Okay? And you see today that the very strict, crazy Hasidim, who are not true scriptural Judaic Jews, but add their Talmud, okay? They want to bring back about what they call the Noahide laws, okay? And under the Noahic covenant, okay? And no, no, you got to watch out for that, okay? You got to watch out for those weird Hasidim who want to bring about, bring back the uh, Noahide laws, uh, which are very, very, very loosely, loosely <laughs> uh, based off of Genesis 9. Loosely, okay, at the best. But let's continue. And God said, verse 12, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. What is this? I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And what are we reading to? Verse 17. Yes. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. That's the covenant that he made with Noah. Okay? To, go, to be fruitful and go multi, uh, multiply, to replenish the earth? Absolutely, yes. But the gist of this covenant that he made with Noah was what? That he wasn't going to destroy the earth with a flood. You know when you get a good thunderstorm around and the sun come out and you see the rainbow? Not the, not the queer rainbow that is missing the color white. Okay? Not that one. But when you see the bow in the cloud, the rainbow, okay? That's what he's talking about. Okay? His bow, his battle bow that he used to judge the earth. Okay? That's what he's talking about. All right? And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud, verse 14, over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Okay? So God, in a covenant unto Noah, said that he wasn't going to destroy the earth. Every time when it rains and then you see the sun and you see the rainbow, okay, the bow, that's the token of the covenant that he made with Noah. Okay? So covenant, a promise, a contract kind of thing, okay, that he makes God with man. And within scripture, yes, there are times when men make a covenant. The Also between a man and wife, the covenant of marriage, it's a pact, it's a promise, okay? Okay? All right? But now, also, to uh, drive this home, Isaiah chapter 54, Isaiah chapter 54, Okay? Old friend. My old friend here. Isaiah chapter 54. We want verses 7 and on to verse 9. 7 on to verse 9. Isaiah 54 verses 7 on to verse 9. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for, for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy God. Verse 9. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me, 
For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. How? In a covenant that he made with Noah. Okay? So have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee nor rebuke thee. Okay? God's anger will not last forever. If it did, we'd all go up like a puff. Remember, the flood lasted for I forget how many days exactly. Okay? Sodom and Gomorrah also. Lot was, you know, the angels came to get Lot out of there. He was the only righteous guy in all of Sodom. But he lingered, and the angels were like, Come on! Come on! We can't do anything to you out of here! Okay? Also, the thing about Lot is also a prefiguring, a type of the redemption of the purchased possession. God's wrath and judgment fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot the righteous <coughs> being taken out before. Okay? All right? But, as we see here for the uh, covenant with Noah, the covenant of Noah was, yeah, yeah go, through, uh, go be fruitful and multiply. Yes, which they did. Okay? But more per se, that he swore by a covenant with Noah that he would never destroy the earth with a flood. And every time you see the rainbow in the cloud, the bow in the cloud, that's the token of the covenant that he made with Noah. Okay? All right? See, God is really, really good on his end about uh, keeping his covenant. It's we as man that fail. Okay? But now let's go to Genesis, the Abrahamic covenant. Back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, the Abrahamic covenant, okay? The Abrahamic covenant, Genesis chapter 12, just to begin, okay? Genesis chapter 12, God here calls out Abram, okay? Genesis 12, verses 1 under verse 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that... I will shew thee. Okay, time of the patriarchs. This dispensation, similar to the one that we are in today, but what they were doing was they were having faith in what God will do. Okay, we've gone over this plenty of times, but today in this dispensation, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, the blood he shed on the cross, it is finished. Our faith is in what he has done. From going from faith and what he will do to faith and what he has done. Okay? But, now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay? And we talk about that in the video about this uh, Abraham's seed, which will also be in the description box. Okay? But now let's go to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. We want to, uh, we're going to skim through this almost this entire chapter. Not going to read the whole thing. We're going to skip a little of it. But check this out. Genesis 15, we want verses 1 under verse 7. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am, circle that, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Just like our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God our Father. He is our He is the blessed hope. He is the redemption of the purchased possession. He is the resurrection. He is our life. He is our hope, okay? And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given me no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And this also has uh, a lot to do with the book of First Chronicles. 
Okay, right there he says, our Lord says, um, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. When you can't number the stars, people have tried, but you can't. But yet in the book of First Chronicles, you could, if you wanted to, number all the descendants that are listed in First Chronicles, which some Jews, some Hebrews in Israel, and even locally have done to prove their lineage that they are actually Hebrews. Okay? But the contrast, he says, as the stars, but yet in First, Corinth, uh, First Chronicles, you can number them all. Very interesting. Don't, don't for a minute uh, think that, well, you as the Church of God, you shouldn't read the arduous reading of the names that are in First uh, Chronicles from uh, chapter 1 on to verse 15. God has a purpose for them, uh, but it's, it's important to note. He says, as the stars, but yet because of judgment, you, you read the number of them within uh, First Chronicles. Just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, and in my daily devotional reading, yeah, I'm in First Chronicles. So let's continue. And he believed in the Lord, Abraham, or Abram did, and he counted it to him for righteousness. We, we get into this in several videos. They will be in the description box. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. Now let's skip to verses 13 on to verse 21 to close of the chapter. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be strangers in the land, in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Talking about the captivity of the children of Israel in Egypt. Okay? And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, talking about Egypt, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. Again, a prefiguring uh, today for our instruction in righteousness. Egypt is the world. Okay, God has called us out of Egypt, the world, and is guiding us onto the promised land, heaven, to be with him. Okay, And God's going to punish Egypt, the world, during the time of Jacob's troubles. Okay, let's continue. Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto him, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, and the Kenizzites, and the Cadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephaims, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So, the covenant with Abram, the promise of the land, Okay, the land of Israel. Israel is in their homeland today, but you got to remember, the land that Israel has today is not the contractual, scriptural allotment given to them by the Lord. What they got today is smaller than what the Lord promised them. And then you got the Jesuits through the our nitwit idiot uh, facade president smoking Joe wanting to go for the two-state solution. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The promised land grant onto the Hebrew, to the Jew, the Abrahamic one, is a lot larger than the one that Israel now possesses today. Okay? Do not forget that. Yes, Israel is in their homeland. They were brought there in unbelief. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 36 in the description box there will be a video about that 1948 what was God doing okay they were brought back in unbelief but the promised scriptural contracted land grant the covenant is they don't have the full allotment okay they don't the contractual land grant 
that Israel is to possess as covenant to them by God is bigger than what they have today. Don't forget that. Don't forget that, okay? And now let's go to Genesis chapter 17, okay? Genesis chapter 17. Now, he was promised a son. And what does he do? He, in his own power, in his own strength, by his own conniving, brought about by Sarah, okay? She was the one who instigated it. You got, lady, hey, sisters, okay? But they went about to bring about God's promises out of their own means. And what happened? Ishmael. And what is Ishmael? Today, Muslim, okay, the sons of Ishmael, the legitimate firstborn of Abraham, okay, yes, or Abram, he was Abram when uh, Ishmael was born, okay, but yes, the legitimate firstborn of Abram, absolutely, but it is in Isaac, the seed is called, his seed is called, okay, all right, but see, Abram and Sarai went in their own power to try to bring about God's promises in their own way. And God didn't bless it. Yes, God blessed Ishmael. Yes, you see their descendants to the descendants of Ishmael today, the Muslims, okay? All right, those are the descendants of Ishmael, all right? Fortunately, unless one is actually genuinely saved and of the church of God, the deadliest of enemies unto the Hebrew people, the Jew, okay? But Genesis chapter 17. We're going to be reading verses 1 on to verse 8 to begin. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Now, when it comes to the land grant, God promised to Abraham I'm, I'm going to give you and your deser your servants that land. That's that's the covenant. Okay, that's that's their land. Okay, without a condition. It's like I'm giving you that. I'm giving you that. Okay, there wasn't a condition to it. It's when they were brought in to the promised land. A lot of conditions. Okay, but let's continue. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face. And God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. Change. Something changes here. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And that's what the name Abraham means, father of many nations. Okay? And note that Ishmael was born while Abram, but Isaac, when Abraham. That, that is not to be missed. That is not to be lightly glibbed over, okay? That is to be so noted, but let's continue. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And then he goes on to talk about the sign of the covenant about being circumcised, okay? All right? The covenant of circumcision given on to who? The Hebrews, the Jews, Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, okay? Yes, the uh, Ishmaelites, the Muslims uh, practice circumcision. Yes, they do. But it is in Isaac that his seed is called, okay? Not in Ishmael. Okay, and then it talks about the uh, circumcision. Okay, um, we uh, well, let's read this verses 9 now on to verse 14. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep 
between me and you and thy seed after thee. Circumcision was given unto the Jews, to the Hebrews, okay? Abraham, father of the Hebrew, okay? Unto Abraham was attributed, or to Abram was uh, attributed the name Hebrew. It was unto Abraham first, okay? But, and here in America, men, ch children are circumcised at birth, usually, okay? Usually. All right. And they talk about the health benefits and yada, yada, yada. Yes, I know. But you got to remember that circumcision was a sign of the covenant given unto Abraham. Okay? Let's continue. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every male among you shall be circumcised. No female circumcision, by the way. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Okay? And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man, child, and your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Okay? And then Paul talks about that in the book of Galatians. Okay? Uh, we do not need to be circumcised in order to be saved, to be right with God. Okay? Because why? That was for Abraham, for the Jew, for a different dispensation, onto the Hebrew. Okay? Not pertinent for salvation today in this dispensation. Okay? you got to rightly divide the word of truth. And verse 14. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh is of his foreskin is not circumcised. That soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Okay? He hath broken my covenant. So circumcision was a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? And then if we were to continue reading, we would re read about how Ishmael was circumcised. Okay? And remember, Ishmael was born on, under Abram. But Ishmael, under Abraham. That that is a signification thing. Don't don't miss that. We're not going to get too deeply into it today. But now let's go to Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24. We want verses 3 on to verse 8. Exodus chapter 24. Verses 3 on to verse 8. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice and said all the words which the Lord hath said will we do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the blood of the covenant, and we'll get to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 20 here in a bit, okay? And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said will, will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you, concerning all these words. We're going to come back to this a little later. Okay? Now, what was happening? The law was brought in. The dispensation of the patriarchs, which was similar to ours today, was over. And the, the time of the law, the law of Moses, okay? And under that dispensation, it was faith and works. You had to do the works of the law. And you had to have faith that God would honor your works that you, that you did. That, in, in essence, you still had faith in what God will do according to you keeping the law. Okay? So we have the law. And what was the purpose of the law? To show man how sinful he is. That he, at his best state... As it says in James chapter 2, verse 20, if you offend in one point of the law, you have broken the whole thing. Okay? 
but the law was there for a specific purpose to be as a schoolmaster to bring us onto Christ eventually, but also to show man of how inadequate, inept he is. That's why when you got people today saying that you got to keep the law of Moses, no, that's heresy. That's heresy. Okay? But Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Right, Deuteronomy chapter 4. We want verses 1 on to verse 8. Why was Israel given the law? They were onto the Jew, the Hebrew, were given the ordinances, the oracles of God. Yes, because under the Old Testament, under the law, similar to the church of God today, if someone wanted to come to the true living God under the law, you would have to eventually go to the Jew, to the Hebrew, to learn of the God of the Hebrew, the true God, the living God, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, okay? You would have to go to them. But, but, as a testimony. Now, the word testimony does not appear, or excuse me, excuse me, as a testament. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. The word testament does not appear within the Old Testament. But a testament, okay, a testament is a proclamation. It's a statement of things pertaining within a dispensation, okay? Check this out as far as a testament, okay? Now, the word testament is not used. But what a testament is, what are they testifying of? Who was the testator of the law? That was Moses, who died before they went into the promised land. Okay? And what brought in the New Testament? The death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Check this out, though. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 and verse 8. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Our Lord promised to Abraham, I'm giving you that land. But when the children of Israel went to inherit that land, eh, they had all these statutes and commandments and laws. And if they messed it up, you read that in Leviticus chapter 26, if they messed that up, uh, they, they, they get kicked out. And boom, look what happened. Okay, well, let's continue. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor, for all the men that followed Baal Peor. The Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Okay, you get that? Let's continue. Keep therefore and do them. You know how Paul and the New Testament God through Paul says that we are ambassadors for Christ? having the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation and that we as the church of God, the church of the living God, we are to live our life in accordance with the scriptures. Okay, why is that? To be a witness, to be a testament, a testimony unto the lost. Okay, now, are you with me? Let's, let's read this. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom, and your understanding, uh, as I said earlier, um, context is the definition of the word within scripture. And wisdom is to fear the Lord. And to depart from evil is understanding. Okay? Now, every appearance of the word wisdom and understanding is not always a reference unto the fear of the Lord or departing from evil. But see, that's defined by the context. But generally, generally, Wisdom and understanding are fear of the Lord and departing from evil. And in this context, keep therefore and do them, for that is your wisdom, fear of the Lord, and your understanding, departing from evil in the sight of the nations, of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding 
So see, the law was all, was given, number one, to show man how inept they are and at their best state they can't please God. Okay, yes. But also to be a testament unto those nations around them. Because remember, uh, you read in Leviticus, I believe it's 18, the, the, the nations outside of Israel, they were sleeping with their mother. They were sleeping with their fathers. They, 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 was, they were committing incense, incest. They were, they were fornicating with animals. They were eating all kinds of things and stuff like that, which God has allowed for us today, uh, today in the New Testament because it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Okay, yes, you can eat pork today. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 4 tells you you can eat pork today. Okay, all right. If you don't want to eat pork, fine, that's up to you. But you can eat pork. It's not part of salvation or keeping the law because you don't have to keep the law today to be saved. Okay, but in them keeping these laws for their own benefit, yes, but also for the benefit as a testament unto the nations of who God was. See? See, the way, look at me, the way you serve the Lord reflects him. Okay? And guess what, cousin? That crosses dispensational lines. We're looking at the proof right here. Okay, let's continue. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Then right away, he's like, oh, only take heed to thyself. But we're not going to read that. Okay? Yes. Yes. And remember, you know, the, like the Babylonians, they drank beer out of skulls. Okay? And they were worshiping devils. But see, Israel come into the promised land. Yes, the law was for their benefit, but also to be a testament unto the others, unto those nations. Okay? Absolutely. Do you see? You see that? Okay? Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. We're going to read two full chapters in the book of Hebrews. We're going to read, be reading Hebrews chapter 9 eventually and Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, okay? Now, the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. In, in Numbers chapter 25 and also in Malachi chapter 2 verses 1 through 10, it talks about the covenant of Levi for an everlasting priesthood under the law. Okay, as long as the law was binding. Okay? We are under the law to Christ. Okay? We are under the law to Christ. But the Ten Commandments, we are not, we, we don't have to keep them today in order to be saved or stay saved. Okay? That doesn't make them of no effect. Absolutely not. Because you read Romans chapter 13. But see, the Ten Commandments had the commandment to keep the Sabbath day. And we are not commanded to keep the Sabbath day today. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Greek is a Gentile, okay? You don't have to keep the Sabbath to be saved, okay? You don't. You don't. That was a sign unto the Jews. If you're a Jew, um, I do believe you should keep the Sabbath. Absolutely. But it is not a requirement for us today for your salvation or to stay saved, okay? You got to remember that. Well, let's continue, okay? A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shewed to thee in the mount. We already talked about this. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, 
by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Yes, yes, he is the mediator of a better covenant. Yes, he is. Don't worry. Let's continue. Which was established on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second, second covenant, okay? The new covenant that will be coming, which is not in, uh, which is not today, okay? For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 9, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Very quickly on that, Acts chapter 15. Okay, Acts chapter 15. Okay. You got to watch out for these people telling you that today you got to uh, keep the law of Moses. You got to keep the Ten Commandments to be saved. You can't. That you just saw right there. They, they couldn't do it themselves even when it was applicable for salvation. They couldn't keep it perfectly. Okay? You got to watch out for these people. Okay? But Acts chapter 15, verses 6 on to verse 11. Okay? And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. What matter? Uh, there were people coming in saying that they had to be circumcised in the matter of Moses... Otherwise, you cannot be saved. That's verse 1. What they were saying was, you got to be circumcised and do the law. Okay? Because remember, circumcision law intertwined. Okay? Intertwined. And that is the circumcision which was given unto Abraham was assigned unto who? The Hebrews. The Jews. Okay? So when someone comes around saying you need to be circumcised after the manner of Moses, meaning you have to keep the law. Okay? You have to keep the law. No. No. Prove that to you. Okay. And the apostles, verses 6 on to verse 11. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of, of the gospel and believe. And God which knoweth the hearts Bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Yes, today salvifically, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Okay, male or female, bond or free, barbarian or Scythian. In salvation, we are all one in Christ Jesus. But see, after this dispensation with the redemption of the purchase possession... Oh, yeah, because it's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's for who? Jacob, Israel, the Jews. Okay? And Israel today is acting more like Jacob rather than Israel. Okay? Really is. Okay? But, see, during the time of Jacob's trouble, there is going to be a distinction. Okay? South ethically. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, because the law is going to return, because that man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to allow the Jews to institute their law again because of the third rebuilt temple. Okay? We've talked about that before, but let's continue. Verse 10. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace, grace through faith, of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. You, you, you guys who want to preach, uh, you got to keep the law today to be saved, to stay saved. You, yeah, how do you get around Acts chapter 15, verse 10? You don't! You don't! <laughs> you don't. Okay? Back to Hebrews chapter 8. Let's reread verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant and regarded them not. I, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. 
For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. After what days? The time of Jacob's trouble. Saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, A new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. New covenant. Um, question. The Jews today... <laughs> uh, uh, is the law in their hearts? Some might argue yes, but they don't keep the 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 Judaic true Judaic laws of Scripture. They incorporate the Talmud, so no, no, they don't. Okay, uh, I will put that my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Hmm. Have, has Israel accepted their Messiah? No. No, they haven't. Their promised king. Go to 2 Samuel, their promised king. 2 Samuel, chapter 7. 2 Samuel, chapter 7. So, God promised to Israel, to Abraham, and his seed after him, Israel, the Jew, the Hebrew, okay? The land, the land that Israel possesses today is not the contracted scriptural allotment given to them by the Lord. But what they have today is smaller than what the Lord promised them. Okay? It is. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 on to verse 17. This is Nathan talking to David. Now therefore... Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be a ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more, as before time. <laughs> Is that happening today? No. Some will say, well, this was fulfilled with Solomon, and that, but yeah, but you, you read the uh, first book of the Kings, and second book of the Kings, and you know, Jeremiah, they were, they were taken out of the land. And in 70 AD, the, the Romans destroyed their temple. So, yeah, it wasn't a permanence. Okay? This is talking in a permanent fashion. Which will be coming, but not yet. And definitely not today. Okay, let's continue. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies... Also, the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And the head of David's house is who? The Lord Jesus Christ. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and will establish his kingdom. And yes, Solomon did that, but Solomon messed it up. Okay? Solomon messed that kingdom up. But see, the line of the king is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Keep reading. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, Solomon built him a throne for his name, yes. But did Solomon and his line endure forever? Yes. How so in our Lord Jesus Christ? Okay, let's continue. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, or case S. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, 
and with the stripes of the children of men. And of course, you read the books of First, Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Oh yeah, look at Solomon. Look at Solomon. Okay. See this. This covenant with David is twofold. Is twofold. The fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of the Davidic covenant is when Jesus Christ is ruling on the throne in Jerusalem. Okay? That is the height, the fulfillment of it. It was predicated by Solomon and godly kings thereafter like Hezekiah and Asa. Yes, but they all messed it up. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he ain't going to mess it up. See? And see, this, this covenant here that we are looking at, this promise, this oath, this thing here is twofold. It is one making reference onto the um, man side of it, and then onto the other side of it that is fulfilled in God Himself, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father. Okay? You understand? Yes? Okay, let's continue. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Right now today, there is no king on the throne of Israel, is there? No. Some like to argue about the, you know, the head rabbi. No, no. But see, that man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to come in during the time of Jacob's trouble and lay claim to that throne. And he's more than, oh, he's not, obviously. At that time, many of the Jews, I believe, are going to get it. And that's going to be midway through the time of Jacob's trouble. With the rebuilt temple, he's going to come in saying, I am God. He's going to look like the Roman Catholic Jesus. And he's going to institute the mark in the right hand or in the forehead. Okay? So let's continue. But my mercy, verse 15 again. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul whom I put away before thee, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And that fulfillment is in Jesus Christ. According to all these words, and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Okay, And then David in true humility is like, who am I? Okay, But now, now let's go to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. We want verses 1 on to verse 5. Now these be the last words of David. David the son of Jesse said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The capital S spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The capital R, Rock, who is Christ, of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Not the little G God of this world, but of the big G God, who is our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Hey, my countrymen in America, boop! Uh, <laughs> Y'all think Trump, Trump coming back for his Napoleonic uh, performance, you think he's going to be... You, you, Crazy. Crazy. Anyway. And he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant. Ordered in all things, and sure. For this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. What does that mean? Oh, it's not going to be grown by mortal man, but God manifest in the flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay, God himself is going to grow that kingdom. God himself is going to be sitting as the son of David, meaning the king of the Jews, on the throne of David the throne in Jerusalem, in Israel, okay? That's the fulfillment of it. That's the everlasting covenant. Jesus Christ is that everlasting covenant. The fulfillment of the Davidic kingdom and also of the Abrahamic covenant, okay? He is the fulfillment of it, okay? At his second coming. But now, let's go 
to Psalm 83. You're going to like this. You're going to like this. I think you are. I hope you are. Psalm 83. Or excuse me. Psalm, uh, was it Psalm 83 or Psalm 89? <laughs> yeah, it was Psalm 89. I, I don't know why I wrote that. Psalm 89. <laughs> yeah, what was I writing? Psalm 89, verses 1 under verse 3. Uh, verses 1 under verse 4, excuse me. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. My mouth will make, uh, with my mouth, with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, my, for I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen, the Jew, Hebrew. I have sworn unto David, my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Shilah. And that's the fulfillment is at the second coming, our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, let's skip a little and read verses 20 on to verse 37. Come on, check this out, man. Check this out. This is beautiful. Skipping. Psalm 89, verses 20 on to verse 37. I told you, this is meat, not milk. I have found David my servant. With my whole holy oil have I anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established. My arm also shall strengthen him. Making reference unto the Lord Jesus Christ. The enemy shall not exact upon him. Nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face. And plague them that hate him. Is that happening today? In small increments but in totality? No. No, it's not happening today. But my faithfulness and mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I will set his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, the lowercase r, rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. My covenant shall stand fast with him. See, the new covenant covenant is the and the new covenant comes in the fulfillment of our Lord Jesus Christ ruling as king, the Davidic covenant over the complete land of Israel, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? The new covenant is when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. Is that happening today? Never mind what Satan and his church tells you. No. No. We are not under the new covenant today. Let's continue. Yes. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Never-ending kingdom. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Not that man of sin, the son of perdition. And definitely not Arturo Sosa, the head of Catholicism. It's not Francis. He's the puppet to Arturo Sosa, the black pope, the head of the Jesuit order. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. And he always kept a, a, a lamp for his anointed for David. Okay? Always according to the covenant. Okay? Yes, nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. You can take it to the bank. Let uh, God be true and every man a liar. He has exalted his word above his name. And then you've got these nitwit scumbag devils, by law is mark a beast, teaching you that the scriptures is not the, man, uh, is not the word of God. Yeah, yeah. His seed shall endure forever. 
And his throne as the sun before me, his seed shall endure forever. That's a reference to Jesus Christ. Verse 37. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Chilla. Question. Is Christ on the throne right now? No, he isn't. Oh, he is king of kings, lord of lords. But on earth, is he ruling and reigning from Jerusalem? Oh, that's right. It's supposed to be Harlem, right? Oh, give me a break. <laughs> no, he isn't. Why? Because we are not under the new covenant yet. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 under verse 8. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous, capital B, branch. And a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming. Okay, today is Israel uh, dwell in safety? Is all Israel and Judah saved? Even you heretics have to admit, no, no, this is, has not come to pass yet. The new covenant is not in effect yet. Okay. Oh, but oh, there's more. Let's go to Zechariah, Zechariah, chapter three, Zechariah chapter three, Zechariah. Zechariah is right before Malachi. Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 8 on to verse 10. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 8 on to verse 10. Hear, no, hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are my, men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the all capital branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the gravings thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. He comes back. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine, and our Lord is who? I am the vine, ye are the branches. And under the fig tree. Don't, don't look at me now. Look at that verse. Look at that verse. Okay? And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Okay? Verse 10. In that day saith the Lord of hosts when our Lord Jesus Christ comes and reigns as king. Shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine. And our Lord says, I am the vine. Ye are, uh, ye are the branches. Okay? Our Lord Jesus Christ call every man ye uh, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine under Jesus Christ and under the fig tree, Israel. Israel, okay, Israel. Not Rome, but Israel. Do you see that? Now, uh, while we're in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter six, verses nine on to verse fifteen. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Take of them of the captivity, even Heldai and Tobijah, and of Jediah, which are come from Babylon, and come thou the same day, and go into the house of Joab, Josiah, the son of Sephaniah. Then take silver and gold, and make crowns, and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, Remember, the, the priesthood was a prefiguring of the high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ, after the order of Melchizedek. Okay? And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, all capital letters, our Lord Jesus Christ. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon 
his throne and he shall be a priest upon his throne yes yes and the council of peace shall be to be between them both Jesus Christ is the high priest there is no priesthood today okay so we the, being finding fault the priesthood being changed okay you know you see these Catholic priests of Satan they're, they're priests of Satan there is no ordained priesthood today there is the priesthood of the believer meaning that you right there you you don't have to go to a God forbid a Jesuit Catholic priest God forbid no you don't have to go to a rabbi you don't have to go to Diana of the Ephesians that Bible is Mark of Beast. You don't have to go to Mark the Mess. You don't have to go to His Holiness. You don't have to go to anybody like that. You can go to the Lord yourself. There is no middle man. You can go to Christ Himself. He is the High Priest. Okay? That's what that's talking about. There is no priesthood today. Okay? There is no priesthood today. You can read about that, uh, uh, you know, read about the priesthood thing in Numbers chapter 25 and Malachi chapter 7, okay? And also in the book of Hebrews, it's been changed because we have a high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. Hence, we go to him directly. You understand? Please? Okay, let's continue. And the crowns, uh, okay, uh, we already read verse 13. And the crown shall be to Helam and to Tobijah, and to Jediah, and to Hen the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. And they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass, if ye will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Also showing us that during the kingdom of heaven, it's all works. It's all works. Why? Because you're going to see him on the throne. Okay? And also, also we have to go back to Amos chapter 9. Okay, it would do you well to regard and to remember this portion in Amos chapter 9 because Amos chapter 9, what we are going to look at, verses 11 on to verse 15, is the strongest portion of scripture that points to the return of Jesus Christ and ruling as David, as the son of David. You know, king. That's what that means, son of David. King. Okay. Amos chapter 9, verses 11 on to verse 15. In that day, second coming, will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and the hills shall melt. During the kingdom of heaven, again, it's going to be farming, an agrarian society, as I believe is the, the name of it. All farming. None of this processed junk. None of this fake garbage. No high fructose corn syrup. All natural. Farming. Hallelujah. Like I've said to my brother in North Dakota, you, you, you're going to get your farm. Okay, let's continue. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink wine, drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. Again, more proof that it's going to be uh, farming during the uh, kingdom of heaven. And I will plant them upon their land, they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord God. Saith the Lord thy God. Okay? Permanent. And like I said, you got the Jesuits right now trying to divide that land. <laughs> yeah. And go back now to Zechariah. Go back to Zechariah chapter 14. Okay? These are familiar unto you, but what does this have to do with the covenant? See, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant, covenant that is coming will come when Jesus Christ is on that throne. This way is east, by the way. That's why I always point that way. When Jesus Christ comes back at his second coming with us, his bride, you know, the church, 
that we got redeemed, okay, when he comes back with us, okay, he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years going into eternity. That's the new covenant. That's the new covenant. Okay? That's the new covenant. When our Lord is ruling and reigning as king in Jerusalem forever and ever. Okay? His, his reign never ends. What changes is Satan is loosed out of his prison for a thousand years and then Satan and all sin and all evil is finally done away with and then the final and seventh dispensation, no sin, eternity, eternity, then all this fulfillment, this, the new covenant. Okay, let's continue. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 on to verse 21. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, who survived, yeah, when our Lord came back, yeah, shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, giving us credence that the law is going to be in effect during the Kingdom of Heaven. What law is that? Oh, the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, There will be offerings back in that uh, time period, too. Okay, Offering for sin, when the one who forgives sin is right there, uh, maybe, but this tells us keeping the Feast of Tabernacles the law is going to be reinstituted, but that law is going to be found within the Sermon on the Mount, which is for the kingdom of heaven. Okay, let's continue. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Again, farming. And if you don't have rain, then you have no crops, you have no food, you're going to be starved out. See, okay. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the earth, that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And see, this is more talking about during the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Because the family of Egypt, plague, and see, after Satan is loosed for a thousand years, and then cast off into the lake of fire, they, they, they ain't going to be no plague. So this, see, this tells us specifically that this is making reference, talking about the kingdom of heaven, the thousand year reign. Okay? And after the thousand years are expired, our Lord is going to let loose Satan for uh, that he's been bound for a thousand years. He's going to go get all the remnant of all these sinners, and they're all going to get destroyed, kaput, kaplui, and they're going to be in the lake of fire. And then finally, no more sin. Because guess what? During the kingdom of heaven, there's still going to be sin. There's still going to be evil. There is. There is. But see, our Lord as king is going to show how what a kingdom is truly like. But see, all sin and evil will finally be eradicated with Satan being cast off finally uh, after the thousand years. And some will be saying like, well, how come, how is there evil if Satan is bound up? Because man is evil. Man at his best state is altogether vanity. Okay? God knows our hearts and our hearts are evil. Okay? Jeremiah chapter 7 verses 8 on to verse 10, I believe that is. Okay? All right? Man is evil. But see, after Satan is destroyed and there's a new heaven and a new earth. Okay? Okay? Yeah. This right here in Zechariah is talking specifically about the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Let's continue. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seethe therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Okay? And now, go to Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. So, the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant has its fulfillment in Jesus Christ when he is ruling and reigning as king in Jerusalem. Hence, the new covenant. 
okay? The new covenant. The new covenant is synonymous with Jesus Christ ruling and reigning as king, okay? When Israel will be following their king, which they are not today, okay? Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 1 on to verse 9. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see, whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail? And all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. And there are heretics out there that talk about, well, that was just one day that our... Shut up. No. This is a future event signified by seven years of God's wrath poured upon the earth where he's dealing with the Jews, the Hebrews, okay? Which Mark the Messenger is not, okay? For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their king, their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. They will serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. David their king. David their king. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Is Israel serving the, the, the true God today? No, they are not. Are they uh, serving their king, David? No, obviously not. No, our Lord Jesus Christ, no, they are not. This is not fulfilled yet. Hence, the new covenant is not in, is not, we're not under the new covenant today. Okay, we're not. All right? And now go to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Verses 31 on to verse 34. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. And we already looked in Acts chapter 15. Okay? Which they break. They couldn't keep it. Okay? A new covenant. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. What days are those? The time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and they will be my their, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Is the true law of the Lord in the heart of Israel today? No. If it were, then Israel would be serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Hello. Okay. But remember, they are enemies of the gospel for our sake. Never forget, as we are seeing. The Hebrew, the Jew, which are not Hamites, which are not Japhethites, but are those chosen out of Shem, because there are those of Shem who are not Hebrews. Okay? Okay? But does Israel today, is the true law of God in their hearts? No. Are they serving their king? No. This is not fulfilled yet. The new covenant is not fulfilled yet. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Hence, 
the time of Jacob's trouble is for the Jews. But see, you got these scumbag Catholics, okay? Scumbags. The Catholics. Not, uh, now, all you Catholics, uh, am I calling you scumbags? No. Uh, you're Jesuit leaders, okay? You're Jesuit leaders. A lot of you Catholics are willfully ignorant and just plain ignorant. You people, no. But see, you're leaders. You're leaders. Those are the scumbags. Okay? But now let's, let's okay, let's end this. Let's go to Jeremiah now, chapter 33, verses 15, on to verse 26. Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 15, on to the close of the chapter. In those days, and at that time, will I cause the branch, capital B, of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and, judgment and righteousness in the land as king. That's not happening today, is it? No. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely, and this shall be the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Is Israel, Judah, Jerusalem dwelling in safety today? <laughs> no. 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 Oh, no. Not at all. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to kindle meat offerings and to do sacrifice continually. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord. Here's the take it to the bank. Sure, it's coming. He has magnified his word above his own name. Meaning, you can trust this. You can trust what the authorized version, the King James Version says. A Bible? Good luck. Good luck. Yeah, look in the comment section. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Thus saith the Lord, if ye can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. Man, you might make the, the clouds black and have it rain, black rain, like it did with Hiroshima. But in reality, man cannot do away with the covenant of the sun and the moon, meaning that it's going to be there. Meaning that the covenant that he has, this new covenant that's coming, that will be, filled, be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, ruling as king, can never, you're, you're not going to stop it. Can't. Okay? As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant and the Levites that minister unto me. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Considerest thou not what this people have spoken, saying, The two families which the Lord hath chosen, he hath even cast them off? Thus they have despised my people, that they should be no more a nation before them. Thus saith the Lord, If my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away. Then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. This new covenant that's coming cannot be disannulled. No matter what. You can take that straight to the bank, boy. And also, let's let's touch a little here in Ezekiel. Okay? Just a little here in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 11. Ezekiel chapter 11. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 11. Verses 18 on verse 21. And they shall come... Oh, yeah. And they shall come hither... thither and they shall take away all detestable things thereof, and all the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them an heart of flesh, 
that they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. In the book of Ezekiel, this is talking about the fulfillment of the Jewish people. Uh, again, is Israel following the true God and David their king, our Lord Jesus Christ? No! It's not fulfilled yet. And also, Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 on to verse 34. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Is, is that how it is in Israel today, that still practice and promote the Talmud? No. No. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the, in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. The total land of the fathers that he promised them. Not what they have today. What they have today isn't the, the appropriate contracted scriptural agreement given to them by the Lord. Okay, let's continue. I will also save you from all your uncleanness and will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good. And ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. This is talking about when the Jew realizes that they blew it. Midway during, and it's sad, because Jews can be saved today, true Jews, true Hebrews, which Mark the Messenger, black Hebrew Israelites are not, which the British Israelites, give me a break, no, okay? But when the Jew, the Hebrew, when Jewry, during the time of Jacob's trouble, Realize that they blew it. This is going to be their heart. Psalm 102. Psalm 102 is perfect for that, okay? Verse 32. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God. In the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cleanse you, cause you to dwell in the cities, and the waste shall be builded. And what are we reading to? Verse 34, And the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. Talking about the restoration during the kingdom of heaven, the farming and whatnot. Okay? A new covenant. A new covenant. A new covenant which is not today. Okay? All right? Now, let's go... Let's go to, well, we'll see. What, before we go there, uh, one second. Excuse me. Like I said, in the comments section, you're going to see that the Bibles take out the word testament and put in covenant. And we're clearly seeing that covenant and testament, and we're going to see, because uh, go to Hebrews chapter 9, okay? Hebrews chapter 9. Okay, we're going to be reading the entirety of Hebrews chapter 9. Okay, the entirety. But what is so dastardly about putting covenant in place of testament? Testament is a testament of that current dispensation. Okay, the death of the testator. Okay, and we're, we're going to look at this. But see, when you put replace covenant for testament, what does that imply? That implies that we are under the, uh, the new covenant. And as we have saw, what pertains unto the new covenant. And today, who are the ones who are building castles? Who are the ones building temples? Oh, well, that'd be the Catholics. And see, this is the thing. See, through the Bibles, Satan, the Jesuits, are teaching people that we are under the new covenant. 
but we're not under the new covenant. And see, Catholicism teaches that Christians are going through the great tribulation, that the great tribulation is a purification for the church to make the church pure for their king to step into the kingdom that they have already built for him to receive. So see, when you read in a Bible, this is the new covenant in my blood. No, it's New Testament. A testament is something actually totally different than a covenant. Okay? Totally different. Because, as we're going to see in the book of Hebrews, um, even though in the book of uh, Exodus, which we're going to look at, it doesn't use the word testament. But see, the law, that was Moses. He was the testator of the law. He died before going into the uh, promised land. Okay? That law, the children of Israel were to keep in the promised land. Are we keeping the law today? No. No. We don't keep the law today to be saved. This dispensation, this dispensation will end with the redemption of the purchased possession. Okay? So that testament, a testament is pertinent onto the dispensation for which it's given. Okay? But a covenant, covenant, contract, okay, is permanent. Okay? But, see, like I said, the Bibles take out testament and put in covenant. In doing so, they are saying that right now, this is the new covenant. Heaven on earth, basically. And what's coming, the actual time of Jacob's trouble, these guys say it's a purification for the church. So when you got heretics saying that the, the rapture is alive, well, yeah, the rapture is alive. It is. But the redemption of the purchased possession, which they are meaning, they're just using erroneous terminology. One, one second, brethren. Okay. Basically, anyone who is against the truth of the redemption of the purchased possession, you're basically a Catholic. And I know the NIFB, they are rabid, uh, as they call it, post-trip. You know, that uh, Christians are going through the Great Tribulation. Okay? Mark the mess. No, the rapture is a lie, guys. Uh, no, you're a lie, Mark the Mess. But you know what? You know where they get that? And see, they taking out testament in the scripture and giving you a Bible that says covenant. Well, hey, that means you're building a kingdom today. And also, Catholics, these guys do not rightly divide the word of truth. And uh, a perfect example, that Mark the Mess. Talk, talking about how, you know, keeping the commandments today and that the Sermon on the Mount is for today. That's no... No, that's for the kingdom of heaven. But see, kingdom builders. You're building a kingdom today for that man of sin, the son of perdition, to step into the kingdom that Catholicism is building for him. See, that's the deadliness, the depravity, the, the horror of when you got Jesuits Messing with God's word and giving you a Bible that says, this is my blood of the new covenant. Oh yeah, words have meaning. Absolutely. Covenant and testament are not the same thing. Okay, but let me read you, to the, I read you this out of Roman Catholic Catechism. Okay. Roman Catholic Catechism. Okay. Uh... <laughs> Here's what we're going to read. Uh, we're going to read their verse number 675 on to verse 677. This is the Bible, the true Bible to a Catholic, okay? This is what I'm going to, we're going to be reading you right here, starting there. See that? The church, the church's ultimate trial. Now they're talking about the building. I'm going to read that up to... Where my finger is, right here, okay? All right? Can you read that? Where my finger is, all right? Pause that and read it. You're, uh, you're against the redemption of the purchased possession? You might as well be a Catholic. Because you believe exactly what the Catholic uh, Church teaches. What? It, what? Gonna, okay, yeah. Post-tribulation. Yeah. 
Okay, so what? You're gonna get caught up and then do a go up and then woo, could do it right that right down. The church's ultimate trial. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception. <laughs> oh, these guys shooting themselves in the foot. Offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. And see, it's in this argument where people like Mark the Mess like, said, well, the, uh, the redemption of the purchased possession, those who preach that say, we're not going to go through tribulation. No, we go through tribulation. We're spared God's wrath. There's a difference. Like I said, the video rebuking that fine young heretic will be in the description box. You watch that. Okay, but see, that's the angle of the argument that comes from the "Yea, hath God said" crowd, the uh, the Catholic Church run by the Jesuits. Okay, the supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo messianism, by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. Boy, these guys are really just shooting themselves. They're bold. And their deception to you. The Antichrist's deception already begins to take shape in the world every time the claim is made to realize within history that messianic hope which can only be realized beyond history through the eschatological judgment. The church has rejected even modified forms of this falsification of the kingdom to come under the name of Millenarianism. Millenarianism. Talking about the redemption of the purchased possession. The Catholic Church is against the scriptures. The redemption of the purchased possession. Especially the intrinsically perverse political form of a secular messianism. The church will enter the glory of the kingdom only through this final Passover. When she will follow her Lord in his death and resurrection, the kingdom will be fulfilled then, not by a historic triumph, triumph of the church through a progressive ascendancy, but only by God's victory over the final unleashing of evil, which will, call, which will cause his bride to come down from heaven. God's triumph over the revolt of evil will take the form of the last judgment after the final cosmic upheaval of this passing word. And yeah, see that? Oh, you don't worship Mary, you venerator, huh? Yeah. Uh, what does that mean, Brad? That means that Catholics teach that Christians are going to go through the Great Tribulation. And it's the purification for the church. We just saw that the time of Jacob's trouble, it's for the Jews, Israel. Catholics say they are Jews. They don't say we are Jews, but they say that they have replaced Israel. Kind of like the black Hebrew Israelites. Kind of like the British Israelites. Yeah. So you see, anyone who claims, it's, 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 it's stupid. Okay, I, I've, I've encountered people who claim to hate Rome, as we should. We hate Rome, yes. They are our enemy, that's Satan's church. We are to hate Roman Catholicism, yes. But yet, they, uh, they are against the redemption of the purchased possession and believe that Christians are going through the time of Jacob's trouble. You're, you're, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous, but you see. You take out the word testament and replace it with covenant. So, and the church is, it's for the purification of the church. And the church is busy building temples and uh, castles and this kingdom that that man of sin is going to come into. Looking like, looking like their Jesus, who doesn't judge, who loves everybody, who's okay with this, okay with that. Oh, yeah, he's going to come in saying, I am God, and he's going to step into the kingdom that Catholicism has made for him. 
That's why you don't mess around with God's word. Okay? Now go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shewbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot and that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, talking about the law of Moses, uh, the, the, the tables of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now, an interesting thing here, hold your place and go to Revelation chapter, where was that? I wrote that down. You're looking right at it, aren't you? Oh, where is it? I thought I wrote it down. One second, brethren. I did. I did write it down on the other page. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Yes. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament. Interesting. And there was light, and there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and a great hail. The Ark of the Covenant, Ark of the Testament. It's a contradiction. No, the Ark of the Covenant, okay, the Ark was a testament unto who? For the children of Israel in a time, because remember, remember when uh, Nebuchadnezzar and whatnot, there's no, uh, there's, uh, I forget where it is. But there's a certain point in Scripture where the Ark of the Covenant is no longer mentioned. Okay, I personally believe that the Lord took up the Ark of the Covenant or, or it disappeared or it's hidden somewhere. They talk about it in the book of Maccabees or something like that, how it's hidden or something like that. But the Ark of the Covenant, which is called the Ark of the Testimony in the book of Revelation. Why? Because the Ark of the Covenant, which held, which we just saw here, okay, Verse 4, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had the manna, manna, okay, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. The manna ceased to, when they were going into the promised land. Aaron's rod that budded to show that the Lord chose Aaron. Okay, you read about that in Numbers, what is that, 13 through 16, okay, with the sons of Korah and stuff like that, okay, and the tables of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, okay, the Ten Commandments, which we do not keep today, okay, even though those are the tables of the covenant, they were a testament, do you get it, do you get it, okay, they were a testament, Onto what God was doing within that dispensation. Okay, let's continue. And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second, and this verse 7 is talking about Yom Kippur, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present. Ooh, get that the time then present present for that dispensation okay there is no temple today never mind what the Baptists say with their church buildings and never mind what the Satan's church Catholicism says with their little castles the, the built we are the temple of the Holy Ghost there are no buildings okay no buildings sanctified within the scripture okay within the New Testament no 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 
No, no. Okay, no. All right? But look at that. Which was the figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. You had to keep doing offerings and sacrifices over and over and over. Okay? Which was for the time then present. Okay? All right? And like we like I've been telling you, the new covenant is the fulfillment of that Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant with Christ as king in the full land of Israel. That's the new covenant, which we are not under today. Okay, let's continue. Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal fleshly ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal capital S spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You mean dead works? Dead works of the law? That's what the scripture just said, isn't it? Why? Because you had to continually do them. You just saw, okay, where the blood of Christ, you know, gets behind the ears. It gets rid of it, okay? It gets rid of it. But see, again, and those wanting to say that you got to keep the law today, it's not finished. It's not finished, then, if you got to keep the law today to stay saved. You're saving yourself because it's dependent on you, not what Christ did. See? That's the heresy. Let's continue. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. The Old Testament, under the law. Moses died, and then they went into the promised land, hence the law, you know. The law was binding for them before they went into the, test, uh, into the promised land. Yes, but see, Moses was the testator of the Old Testament, under the law, which we don't keep today. See? See? And yes, the law is going to return during the time of Jacob's trouble. And we've already discussed that. And yes, the law is going to be there during the kingdom of heaven. But there again, you've got to remember, during the time of Jacob's trouble, it's faith and works. And during the kingdom of heaven, it's all works. Okay? And then in eternity, there is nothing. Because no sin. Okay? But, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal life. See, the Old Testament under the law could never make the comers there perfect. It was our schoolmaster to bring, him, bring us unto Christ. And Christ fulfilling the law in the taking away, uh, what does it say there? For the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament? Okay? That's how Christ fulfilled the law in that manner. In the, uh, for the redemption of the transgressions. We're not, when you sin today, you go to the Lord in prayer because he is our high priest. We go to him personally. Lord, I'm sorry for doing that. Please forgive me. Under the law, you had to go to a Levitical priest and he, you know, kill an animal and you'd have to sp uh, spill the blood. But see, as we have already said, that didn't make anything perfect. But the shedding of Christ's blood on the cross did. Do you understand? Do you understand the difference? Okay, let's continue. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Of necessity. Moses died before he went 
before the children of Israel went into the promised land. We already looked at that, at that in Deuteronomy chapter 4, okay? That the law there was a testament, not only for the Jews, but also for the nations. A testament of God's grace in that dispensation. And during that dispensation, it was faith and works. This dispensation, the death of the testator, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, okay? He brought in the New Testament, okay? And this dispensation, the New Testament, is going to end. With the redemption of the purchased possession, okay? And then, during the time of Jacob's trouble, at the end of it, our Lord Jesus Christ comes back, and hence bringing in the New Covenant. But see, again, there's still going to be sin there during the kingdom of heaven. Okay, But again, the new covenant has everything to do with Jesus Christ ruling and reigning at Jerusalem over the Jew, over the totality of the allotted land given unto Israel. That's the new covenant which we are not under today, dear friend. Okay? Those Bibles... You know, in Romans chapter 13, those Bibles take out, um, thou shalt not bear false witness. Why? Because those Bibles are bearing you false witness. We're not under the new covenant today. But let's continue. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Of, is a force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. And with that, when you... Uh, compare that with the Old Testament law of Moses. He died. They went into the promised land. It fits. Moses was the testator of the Old Testament. While our Lord Jesus Christ is the testator of the New Testament. Okay? And the New Testament begins with the death of the testator. Not the birth. And But see, how would you know that? Because if you're reading a Bible, it says covenant. And I have seen, you know, I have seen Bibles that, you know, uh, the thumbnail that I took for this video, okay? I have seen Bibles that say, that say New Covenant instead of New Testament, okay? And even thus, Bibles say New Testament, but yet within the pages, it says New Covenant? Yeah. Verse 18 in Hebrews chapter 9. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. See, this is not a contradiction. It is not a contradiction. Whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, and I do not believe it was the Apostle Paul, but it was the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, our Father, who wrote the scriptures, okay? But never mind that. But see, this is not a contradiction. He's referring on to the former covenant as a testament because, in fact, it was a testament not just to the Jew but also to the nations. Okay? But yet it was a covenant. It's not a contradiction. It's not a contradiction whatsoever. Because we don't keep the uh, law of Moses today to be saved or stay saved, do we? No, we don't. Don't. Don't listen to liars like Mark the Mess, okay? They're, they're, they're Judaizers trying to bring you under the law, which the, even the Jews themselves couldn't keep, okay? This is not a contradiction. Let's keep reading. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wood and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Now, you, now hold your place here. Go right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Go right now back to e, uh, Ezekiel. Exodus chapter, what was it? 24? Exodus chapter 24. Okay. Exodus chapter 24. Okay. We want verses 3 on verse 8. What verse do we want specifically? Uh, uh, what did he say? Yeah, verse 8. Excuse me. 
And Moses took the blood in <laughs> Exodus chapter 24, verse 8. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which they break. We already looked at it. They broke the covenant. They couldn't keep it. They couldn't. At their best state, they broke it. Okay? Okay? God did that purposely to show man that the, as the Jew that you couldn't do anything without him. Okay? Okay? That was the purpose of the law. And we already read that they break it. Okay? And we already just read that the old was done away that the new may be established. Okay? So, when he says, And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Okay? But here, verse 20, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined upon you. It's not a contradiction. See, they broke that covenant. God, on the other hand, doesn't break his covenant. We already looked at that. But see, that was what was what? That was what? Was, which was a figure for the time present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Hence, it's not a contradiction. Hence, the Old Testament, because it is a testament onto what God did within that dispensation. He didn't break his covenant. Man did. And as we already looked, he was going to make a new covenant uh, that they, you know, which he does, which they will not break. Okay? This is not a contradiction, dear friend. Not a contradiction whatsoever. Not a contradiction whatsoever. And, and, and also, verses 16 and 17. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Okay? Uh, go to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Verse 7. Just one verse. John chapter 7 verse 7. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Testify of it. Okay? Testify of it. And go now to John. Backtrack to John. Chapter 3. Yeah. Yeah. Of course we're going there. Yeah. But we're going to read the whole context. John chapter 3. Beginning at verse 16. On to verse 21. For God so loved. Past tense. The world. That he gave. Past tense. His only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world, and men loved God darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved but he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be manifest that they are wrought in God and go now to John chapter 15 verses 18 we're going to the time verses 18 on to verse 27 If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you, for, for ah, but all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, 
because they know not him that sent me. Verse 22 specifically here. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. A testator, giving a testament of what man is. Under the law, Moses as the testator, the law of Moses, testament of what man is. Okay, testimony like we give a testimony of what law the Lord did for us. Testimony, okay, that's what we give. But the testament is what our Lord has given, and a testament is pertinent unto the dispensation in which it appears, because we are not keeping the law today, are we? And after this dispensation, dispensation ends, which is by grace through faith, hence, time of Jacob's trouble, faith and works, the kingdom of heaven, works, eternity, nothing, because sin is gone, see, you see, this time period right now, which is similar unto the time of the patriarchs, we've already discussed it, will never be again after this time period is up. That's why you gotta stop wasting your time and get your head out from betwixt your buttocks and get serious. Because so once this dispensation is over, dear friend, you're gonna you're gonna have all these Christians telling you just believe. Come, oh, you gotta rightly divide the word of truth. They themselves are not dispensational. They're gonna damn you to hell when you take the mark of the beast. You need to get serious. You need to stop messing around. Verse 23, he that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father, because Jesus Christ is the father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Which we are doing as ambassadors for Christ today, under the New Testament. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 9. Picking up at verse 21. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, because he is our high priest, he is God the Father. We go to him, okay? We go to him directly. No priest, no middleman, no redemptrix, the Roman Catholic Mary. <coughs> yeah, the Roman Catholic Mary. Yeah, Semiramis, the queen of heaven. Yeah, here, the Roman Catholic Mary. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Neither yet that he should... Oh, Catholic. What is salvation to you, Catholic? Okay? You got to do the Mass, right? You eat the cookie and you drink the blood, right? And that's how you have Jesus Christ. And the Mass is a continuing of the sacrifice. So Christ is being sacrificed every day in a Roman Catholic church. Uh, nor yet that he should suffer, should offer, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. If you read this in the scriptures, how could any of you 
Dear Catholics, fall for your scumbag leaders telling you that you have to take Mass all the time and that's how you're saved. And you don't know if you're... See, you Catholic, you know you're going to heaven? See, you don't know because that's the sin of presumption. And brethren, people, you want to you wanna witness onto a Catholic? Catholics are hard to witness, very hard to witness onto. But you know a good way to start uh, a witnessing thing, to talk with them? You, you talk with them about the eternal security thing. You talk to them about knowing, like it says in the book of 1 John. That's a good way to open dialogue with a Catholic. You go right for the throat. You know you're going to heaven? Well, i got to die in the state of grace. Uh, see, the scriptures say that we can know for sure. And a Catholic can't, if they're, if they're anything of their, their Catholic faith, they cannot say that they know for sure they're going to heaven because that's a sin of presumption according to their own writings. Okay? Keep that in mind next time you're talking to a Catholic. Okay? For then must he have... That for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was just once Catholic, offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So you see, dear friend, a testament is pertinent unto that dispensation and where it appears. Yes, the word testament only appears within book, the New Testament. And the example given of Moses and the, te uh, the testament and whatnot when he didn't say testament in the book of uh, Exodus. It's not a contradiction. See, because that was the old. That was done away with that the new may be established. Do you see? Hence the difference between covenant and testament. They're two different things. They're not the same. And when you got... When you got these devils in their Bibles, this is, yes, it says Holy Bible on there, but it doesn't say that within the text, okay? When you got the Bibles taking Testament out and putting covenant in, t telling you that we're in the new covenant right now, we are not in the new covenant right now. Because Jesus Christ isn't on the throne Israel is not dwelling safely, uh, free from all enemies. Okay? That's, and Israel is not following their God. They are not the people of God right now. They are, the, they are uh, beloved for the Father's sake. The fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Absolutely. Absolutely. But they right now, they are enemies of the gospel for our sakes. But they are beloved for the Father's sake. The Jew, the Hebrew, is the apple of God's eye. And as we have just proven through the scriptures, that doesn't change. So, that is going to be it for this video. This uh, took me a little while to get this uh, video done because the Lord had other things. And we finally sat down and it's like, okay, I'll do this. So hopefully the, there will be a lot of uh, videos in the description box. Um, and also, like I said, in the comments section, I am going to uh, put uh, references off of Bible Hub to show you, not all of them, but just, you know, that the Bibles take away a testament and put in covenant. And if we're under the new covenant, so then that must mean that the great tribulation is for Christians and the purification of the church. And when we've gone through this purification, then Jesus is going to come and into the kingdom that man has already established for him. You see the danger there? You see that? Oh. That's going to be it for this video. I hope this will help some of you. Um... I hope this will clear up some of the... But dear friend. Dear friend. Read the scriptures. The authorized version. 
The NIV is not God's word. That's man's word. The ESV is not God's word. That's man's word. The New American Standard is not God's word. That's man's word. Okay? Anything that is not the King James Version is not God's word. This is God's word. It's perfect and errant. This you use to translate into other languages. Oh, you saying that they got to learn in English in order to know what God said? Uh, you guys say that they got to learn Hebrew and Greek. Get over yourself. And get the scriptures. Because the Bibles that are given to you from Rome are teaching you false doctrine and guiding you to hell. Because how many people who believe they're, you know, good Christians reading their Bibles, how surprised are you going to be at that day when you don't hear come up hither? Especially if you think like a Catholic that you're going to go through that time period. And as a Christian, you are. As a Christian, you are going to go through that time. So. Thank you so much for watching this. If you do, we love you. We pray for so many of you. Please keep us in your prayers. Uh, we need all the prayers we can get. Uh, thank you to all of you who love us and help us and pray for us. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. And any questions? Any questions? There are two emails on the videos now. If you want to get a hold of me, you can. If you send me, Mr. Bryce, uh, if you send me pornographic things, I'm going to expose you publicly. Okay? If you threaten me, I'm going to expose you publicly. Just so you know. Okay? So, anyway, that's it. Got to get this uploaded. Thank you so very much, brethren. We love you, and we will see you in the next video.